like, hey, you know, life is to be enjoyed, not endured. Welcome to Tony's Backstage Pass. This is a behind the scenes of the music industry where Tony strips back the curtain and shows you what really goes on. So tune in and tune up. It's gonna be a wild ride. In this episode of Tony's Backstage Pass, I meet up with my good friend, Fred LeBlanc. Fred is the larger than life lead singer and drummer for the New Orleans rock band, Cowboy Mouth. I not only love this band, I love playing with this band. What do you say? I sit down with Fred and he opens up about his career, keeping a band together, putting on a kick-ass rock show, and his journey on becoming one of the best front men in rock today while sitting behind a drum kit. So let's pull back the curtain, let's go backstage and hang out with Fred LeBlanc. Cheers. So thank you for having me sit in yesterday. You did a great job. I, I appreciate you it. You did it was a great so, job. I enjoy it. You guys are so much fun to be on stage. You are fun. Yeah. But a lot of bands aren't. You know, a lot of bands are up there, they're just, you know, looking down. You guys entertain, yeah. you know? And, and the one thing I, I love about you, not only watching you and being on stage, is, you know, you're master of ceremonies. You're there to put on a show, to make sure everybody's involved. You never leave anybody out. Mm -hmm. I, and, and not only are you singing and playing drums, you're scanning the place. You, nothing gets by you. Nothing. I mean, I, I mean, is that just years of, of doing it? But I, I, it's a combination of like my personality, uh, you know, wanting to make sure that the show goes as well as it possibly can, and just years of doing it. You know, you learn all the signs. You learn, you learn that okay, this guy over here, he's having his fight with his girlfriend, and she just left, so he's depressed. What can we do to turn that around and make it work for everybody? Okay, this guy over here, he's upset with his wife because she's mad at him for drinking a little too much. How can I take the pressure <laughs> off of that? It's just the way my mind works. It's just go, while go, you're go, singing, go, all remembering the, time, the all lyrics, the time, yeah. playing. Remembering the lyrics is not a mental thing. Remembering the lyrics is muscle memory. Everything I do is muscle memory. Really? Yeah. When I learn lyrics, you know, even though I write the songs, it'd be like, it'd be about something specific or sometimes non-specific but the way i learn lyrics is is muscle memory like you know Janie says turn off the radio you know it's just it's just something that i put in my arsenal that can flow out of me because the way i see it the less the less i think about what i do the more intuitive and immediate it is the better it is so like i get out of the way my ego gets out of the way you know whatever worries or fears I'm living at the moment, they're not in the way of me performing, of getting to the audience and helping to create that moment between everybody. Yeah, because you are very, it must be second nature because it, it looks like you're not thinking about it I'm at all. I'm not thinking about it at all. And that's good, and that's cool. Well, I, and to. I think a lot of people should pick up on that, you yeah. know, because yeah. they, I think like a, as musicians, we tend to want to think about that kind of stuff. Guitar well, you're looking to, and, you're looking, you know, musicians more often than not are trying to achieve a goal, whether it's in the moment or whether it's in the show or whatever, I want to go this route musically or I want to be perceived a certain way or I want to have this experience. And the thing about it is, I, you know, I tell this to musicians all the time, it's almost a cliche. You're, you're not trying to play the music, you're trying to get to the point where the music plays you. You know, in that you step out of the way, you've done every bit of preparation you can, you've, you've had the experiences, you've written the songs, you've performed the songs, you know, the sound is, you know, you have to trust the sound man, 
You have to trust the light man, and you have to trust the audience that they're invested in the moment with you to where you can get to that point where the moment just happens. And that's what I try to do. That's what I try to do with Cowboy Mouth, and it's worked all these years, you know. I've been able to do this for, you know, over 30 years. Everybody scream! Stop whitening your smile the old-fashioned way with strips and trays that can take 30 minutes to an hour. I'm Jonathan Greenhut, the CEO of Paraswabs. When I met Dr. Ginnaker and he introduced me to Paraswabs and I saw how effective they were and how easy they were to use, I knew we had to share it with the world. Paraswabs was clinically studied to whiten natural teeth as well as stained caps, crowns, and veneers. It's so effective, it works on stains caused by coffee, tea, red wine, and even smoking. For those of you who have that one stained tooth, Power Swabs can target that area using swab precision. I was actually able to take the swab and really get through some of those areas that are kind of like untreated. I can immediately see the shades getting brighter and brighter or whiter and whiter. Order Power Swabs and receive up to 50% off the retail price. And as an added bonus, get a free quick stick pen with your order. Dial the number on your screen today. Now, you told me one time, and I couldn't believe this, you mm -hmm. actually had a record label tell you when you guys got signed, well, just get another drummer. There's no way you're going to yeah, yeah, yeah. entertain an audience yeah. sitting behind a drum kit. Yeah, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm the drummer. I'm the There's drummer. no we, kit big enough to hold you back. I mean, it, I mean it, it, the kit almost goes away sometimes. Here's, here's what I noticed, you know, because I can play a bunch of different instruments. You know, drums are my yeah. first love. They always have been. But I can play guitar. Mm -hmm. I can play bass. I can play piano. But here's what I noticed, you know, um, when, I, when I was younger, I noticed when I played guitar, it was nice. When I played bass, it was nice. When I played piano, it was nice. When I played drums, people watched. I was like, ooh, this is different. This is, this is different. And I noticed that reaction right off. And I was like, okay. This, you know, and, and that's what you have to keep your eyes and ears tuned for, something that people react to. And there's a visceral reaction to me when I play. I don't know what it is. I'm not conscious of what I'm doing in terms of, you know, doing something different that people pay attention to. All I know is that when I play, people watch. They may love it, they may hate it, but they watch. Right. And once I understood that, I understood that I couldn't really play anything else with a band and expect to be, expect to have the influence that I was hoping to have. But did you get any, early on, did, I mean, when you guys would show up, did you get any flack? Like, hey, the drums are in the back. No, oh, yeah. pull those up to the front. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sound we guys used to, Well, what stuff. happened was when we first started playing, you know, we would tour around a bit. And uh, after a couple of years, we had all these record labels, you know, like the A&R guys and the promotion guys would come to see us. They'd be packing the shows, going crazy. We love God. We're not. That's great, man. You guys are great. Awesome. You want to sign us to a record label? <laughs> of course not. A front man who's a drummer will never work. It's like, okay. And they're all out of their jobs. So and and I still got mine. And you're yeah. still here. So, I, and that brings up a good point when you're mm -hmm. saying about Cowboy Mouth. I didn't realize, and, and maybe you could tell the story mm -hmm. of how you guys got that name, because it actually means something. It means something, but uh, initially it was really, <laughs> it was uh, the, the term itself, cowboy slang for uh, like somebody who talks with a dirty mouth. Yeah. And um, it's also the name of a, a play written by Sam Shepard, in which these two uh, kind of wandering spirits more or less. I've never actually read the play. I've only had synopsis mm -hmm. given to me. Um, these two people basically trying to create the ideal rock star and using themselves as inspirational vehicles to create that. And you know, it was kind of like the, uh, the, the quote was, rock and roll Jesus with a cowboy mouth. And when we chose the name, it was really because we had gigs already booked and we needed a name. It was the only name we all didn't hate. I was like, okay, we'll, we'll call it Cowboy Mouth and we'll change it later on. But then <laughs> on a local and regional level, like immediately the band took off and we were stuck with it. It's like, 
And then comes the thing, well, do you guys play country? No, it's a rock band, but we do play some country and blah, 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 blah. But then eventually over time, you know, this kind of, you know, this personality emerged from me because when I first started the band, I didn't want it to be a typical rock and roll thing. Hey, hey, we're going to get drunk and we're going to go. It was just cheesy. At the time, you know, the band started in early 1990, uh, late 1990. And, you know, hair metal and all that type of stuff, you know, and that was kind of anathema to me because the bands, the 80s bands I loved were bands like The Replacements and Black Flag and things like that. The Beat Farmers, yeah. you know, bands that were against the grain, not right. doing the whole typical mainstream thing. Right. And so I... When I became a frontman, because I wasn't a frontman before. No, I was going to say about being in the band before Kyle. I was, yeah, I was in a band called Dash, Dash Rip Rock that yeah. was kind of like a country punk band. But I was just the drummer, more or less, although I started writing songs. And, but, you know, the guitar player was the front guy. And um, when I became a frontman, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. And, so, and, I, and I didn't want it to be typical. I didn't want it to be, hey, we're going to have fun. We're going to party, everybody. You know, it was usual. But that's beat. how it was then. Though. That's how it was. That, all BS, the party yeah. bands, the, the, the party Motley yeah. Crews and the Poison. Van and Halen. Even, yeah. Great bands. Yeah, no. Great bands, but, but just that, not that what I wanted to attitude. do. But that party attitude, yeah. It was, yeah, but it was also I saw being, you know, being, you know, a little punk rock shithead as I was, you know. I also was, had been around enough to see that punk rock, as much as I loved it, as much as I still love it, was basically a car going 90 miles an hour against a brick wall. I was like, okay, how do we take, how do we do something besides this? Yeah. You know, and one of the best shows I ever saw was uh, John Lee Hooker playing at Tipitina's. It was a Tuesday night, it was before his renaissance, before he, you know, started playing theaters and festivals yeah. and all that stuff. He was just this old blues guy. It was him, a bass player and a drummer. And, you know, they just piled out of a van and he was just, he was this old guy just doing his thing. He sat down the whole show, and he was just great. And it wasn't great because, you know, because of any, you know, perception of past. It was great in the moment because you could tell he was giving every ounce of himself, every ounce of himself in that moment to make that moment something. I was like, okay, that's awesome. And I kind of look at us now, you know, that rock and roll is not the prevailing trend it's not the zeitgeist of the moment. Right. You know, I kind of look at us like kind of like that, you know, just this is what we do. This is how it's done. And you just you just go for that moment because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to create a series of moments that resonate with people that people will take with them and do with whatever, you know, whatever they choose. Well, to. And, and, and as musicians and music in general, I, I think that's what the memories are, are based yeah. upon mm -hmm. because no I've never met anyone who's a, into music or a musician uh -huh. that said well I saw a bunch of concerts and they were all great they always name this happened at this point in my life yep. there was always and mm -hmm. and I, I said this um, before as musicians we get inspired and then we you know hopefully inspire back yeah, yeah, you yeah. know it flows through us oh, yeah, yeah. it's not something we hold on to no. we can't no. and and you're a, a great example uh -huh. of creating moments because um, a Cowboy Mouth show is not just a, a band playing at some bar at no. night. You create a moment and you say it many times during the night. This is about us. You only have this. You only have this moment That's right inspirational here that. yeah. for people to hear that. Well, you know, the, uh, I guess I've been around long enough to understand that people take these experiences really to heart. I mean, it's not about me. It's not about John... Uh, Brian, Frankie, or anybody who's been in the band, or anybody who will be in the band. It's not about us personally. It's about those moments. You know, people would would send me texts or emails or you know or something like that, and they would just tell us these wild stories about shows they've seen and how much they meant to them, or how this show got them to change their life, or this. You know, it's like I got I got an email, email one time about how this woman was homeless had lost everything and was preparing basically she was living in her car preparing to take her life and as she was you know getting ready to you know do whatever she was going to do one of our songs came on and 
you know, in that moment she had a change of heart. It has nothing to do with me, it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with how she perceives that moment. You know, so I'm not here to pat myself on the back or anything, but these are the things, this is the tapestry of life that we're all a part of, you know, no matter what we do. And being aware of what you put out in the world, I just try to be a little more conscious of, of trying to put out something that works for the spirit as opposed to against it, you know? Not, not, not in any sort of congratulatory way or any, any of that. It's just, you know, you either, you either work well, you with never, the flow or you work against the flow. And you never make the show about yourself. Even though, never like I say, your master of ceremonies, never you, don't, you I, never I'm, make it about you. No, and I'm willing to fall off the high, I'm willing to, I'm willing to fall off the high wire and land on my face. You know, because I have many times, <laughs> literally. You know, and, and I don't mind that. You know, because I've had those experiences of just like, you know, you know, looking like a complete fool in front of hundreds or thousands of people, and you're just like, okay, well, next, let's go. You know, what are you gonna do? Want more backstage stories? Become a member of our Patreon page. You'll get access to bonus footage, full performances, swag, and special live events where you can interact with guests. This is your Backstage Pass. Being an old student of music, an old student of rock and roll, I used to buy bootleg live albums, yeah. you know, back when that was a thing. And one of yeah. my favorite ones was this, uh, this live album from The Clash. And those guys were just a mess. And half the show sounded like a train wreck, but the other half sounded sublime. And sometimes it'd be within the same song. You know, you'd be like, rrr, rrr, and then, rrr, and then they just soar. It's like, I like that. And that feeling, that feeling, that redemptive kind of explosion of joy, even if it's just in the millisecond, you know, things like that, that can change your life. And you know, you don't even realize it. And rock and roll changed my life. You know, I was a misfit, a little, you know, I had, you know, I had nothing. You know, my folks, they loved me, but I was the youngest of four and, you know, I came much later and by the time I came along, they were just done, you know, raising kids is hard. Yeah. And so I was kind of left to my own devices and, you know, I was an odd kid, I was quirky, I was weird, I was the weird kid. And I had to find something that really resonated with me and for whatever reason I found these old, like, you know, these old rock and roll records like Bo Diddley when I was like, 12 years old working in a used record store yeah. where I would um, alphabetize records because because I made two bucks an hour you know on Saturdays and yeah. I didn't have many friends to play with so I did that and I'd pick out something that looked interesting oh Bo Diddley what is this holy shit, that's wonderful Patsy Cline what is this holy shit, that's wonderful you know yeah the doors holy shit, that's great you know and you just find stuff that really clicks with you as a person and really inspires you to take the next step because we all need inspiration right. to take the next step whether it's family whether it's job whether it's career whether it's spiritual whether it's you know Bo Diddley yeah. you know whatever you know we're all looking for inspirations to take the next step and as human beings as people it's kind of our duty to kind of encourage everybody to help take that next step whether it's family friends you know, yeah. work colleagues, things like that. And I think as musicians, we tend to hail from a little bit of the same place where I think as musicians, we all tend to feel like we were a little off center yeah, yeah, yeah. somewhere. <laughs> like me, I always tell people, I come from an era of music where musicians were ugly, man, and the yeah. music was tough and it was music hard, was tough, and yeah. I loved it. Yeah. And I, because I the never. The music had a force. Behind yeah, because yeah. I didn't feel that I was, you know, I wasn't rich or mm -hmm. beautiful or this or that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, all the other stuff you saw in and that's school what on I, TV. That's what I hated when music became that. Yes. You know, it was, it was about all. And the, I got resentful. It was about all the pretty people, and it was like, I'm not pretty. <laughs> I've no, never been pretty. I, I liked it when the yeah the Ramones were ugly. The Ramones were ugly, but they were the coolest guys ever. They were the coolest you know? guys ever. But at the same time, you know, this was this was a frustrating thing for me because like those differentiations between you know, people who start playing music, and then for whatever reasons they become the flavor of the moment, and then they look back at the people who say, maybe 
weren't as kind to them or, you know, the type that took, you know, that picked on them because you were different. Right. You know, we're all just trying to get through this life. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't form your own cool kids club to try to take the piss out of the other cool kids. You know, yeah, we're all just yeah. trying to get through life. It's like, you know, it's, I've never really, I used, I used to hold those grudges when I was younger. And then you get older and you just realize, you know, nobody has it easy in life. No. Some people have it easier. Right. But nobody has it easy. No, we're all no, just trying to get through Nobody this gets thing. out alive. Nobody gets out alive, <laughs> man. Nobody, Hank Williams, baby. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim Morrison. So there you go. But, that, but that's part of the, the I, that's what I like, you know, mm -hmm. and, and doing the show now and everything. Mm -hmm. that's, I, I haven't seen that conversation. And when we were talking about doing something like this, mm -hmm. For me, we've had these conversations yeah, many, many times, many times and yeah. with other musicians and stuff. That was one of my things where it's like, it's a conversation musicians have that I've never seen. I think there's kids out there, as we know, yeah. that were just like us, just because, you know, they're on their, their computers and the game. And yeah. it's a, mm -hmm. It doesn't make the feelings of doesn't make the feeling being eight all, years you, old and being 10. And yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's not about... It's not even about the music per se. It's no. about the experience of being alive. It's that feeling yeah. of being off center or disconnected with the with the world around you and trying to find your place, no matter whether that is, whether it's a guitar, whether it's a drum, whether exactly. it's a gaming console, whether it's film, whether it's, you know, writing, whether it's whether it's, you know, being a CEO, whatever it is, you know, it's just a matter of, you know. Finding your, place, finding your place, you know, finding your people, the, you know, being creative, mm -hmm. you finding know, your place in the world because it, it's not promoted a lot. Yeah. I, I, and yeah. I, I was, t I was telling um, a friend of mine, he was saying when he, he goes, were you like this as a kid? And I'm like, you know what? I was exactly like this mm -hmm. yeah. as a kid. And I, I remember they, <laughs> my guidance counselor told my parents that I needed therapy because they're <laughs> like, because I wanted to be a musician yeah, and yeah, I'm yeah. 16 years old. And, and he's like, well, what do you think? You're going to be some rock star? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm exactly doing this. <laughs> and he's like, well, no, 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 you need to get a real job. And I'm like, you don't understand. This is, hap this is my life. I don't want a job. I want a career. I want to, well, this is yeah. who I am. You know, what, no, and, I, and at the time, I didn't know yeah, what no, that yeah, meant. Course, nobody knows. But all I knew is that was something I was going to do. And I was going to figure out a way of making it happen. I lucked out. My folks sent me to this uh, prestigious uh, Catholic uh, military school in New Orleans, Jesuit High School. Great school, wonderful school. I, I appreciate going there a lot more now that I'm older than I did when I was there. Um, you know, it's where all the future movers and shakers go and you know, yeah. that type of thing. And uh, I lucked out because I was kind of a, I was very much a misfit, I didn't really fit in. Um, you know, uh, but I was also amiable enough to make friends and things like that. But, uh, you know, still trying to find my way. And I'll never forget this, this, there was this guy in my grade, his name was uh, Lou Tevenow, a really talented musician. He wanted to form a band with some kids he knew who were mu musicians, right? So it was him on guitar, a buddy of ours on bass, me on drums and all this type of stuff. And we were trying to get together, but we were kids. We didn't know what we were doing. And finally, out of frustration, I just started banging my drums, kicking them over and throwing the stool. <laughs> and the, guy, the teacher who was in charge of watching us, because we were in like a, like a school auditorium, he comes up to me and says, LeBlanc, see me after school. I was like, oh, great, wonderful. And he was a guidance counselor. So I thought, you know, I was going to get my ass chewed out. And so I go after school, hang dog, sit in his office. He goes, LeBlanc, whatever you do in life, don't ever stop playing drums because you're too good. I was like, that was the first time I'd ever heard anything like that. Wow. His name was Mike Barakos. He lives in Memphis now. He actually came to a show a, few uh, a couple of years ago. And it was like, hey, you did this. <laughs> but, um, and it was that moment, just like that. It was like, wow, okay. And it was the first person, first adult who told me something like that. That, that is like, important. So yeah, you it was remember a, it still yeah, to this oh, day. Yeah, I still remember it to this day. To yeah. this day. Remember it pl plain as day. And um, my friend Lou, he actually, <laughs> because at the time I was still working in the, the used record store, I hadn't really found much about punk rock, you know? And so Lou, he was a very strong guy. Um, 
and he made me take the Clash's first album home. And I'm like, uh, I don't want to hear this crap. He's like, uh, take this album home. I'm going to kick your fucking ass. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the album home, put it on. I was like, oh, this is wonderful. It was the first time I heard Joe Strummer. I was like, ah, this, is, this is everything. This is, yeah. you know, because, you know, I would find these old records like country and blues records, but, you know, I had no idea what it was like to be a black guy in Mississippi or Memphis in the 40s and 50s. I had no idea what it was like to be some, you know, sharecropper in Kentucky or Tennessee, but I could relate to the feeling, the feeling, the emotion, yeah. the feeling of those guys trying to find their place in the world. And, and you know, guys and women too, you know, just the great singers of the era and that emotional resonance, you know, and there's something we were talking about a little while ago, uh, you know, about it not being about us and it never is and to the lay person you can think oh look at this this person gets all this attention this person gets all this you know yeah and they don't realize that it has nothing to do with me i'm just kind of like a catalyst right um do you remember that old uh, old uh actor comedy guy uh michael richards yeah he played kramer on yeah. seinfeld mm -hmm. yeah and he had the meltdown on that stage where he started screaming a bunch of racial stupidity <laughs> he was, you know, he just yeah. and destroyed his career. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah well, yeah. he did an episode of that Seinfeld uh, car series. Oh, right? yeah, Comedians in Cars. Yeah. I saw that, yeah. And he was, he was known, long, you know, he was known as somebody who was really talented and really good at what he did. But he, it, he found it difficult to work with other people because he was so focused on himself and what he was doing. And, it was, and watching that, watching that, um, watching that series, he, he, he says he learned something really important. He said, you know, I used to focus on my craft and focus on this and blah, blah, blah. And, I, you know, it, it, I learned from that whole thing that it's not about me. It's not about me at all. I'm like, it's never about us. It's not about, you know, we're just translating this to others, you know. It's just, you right. know, it's kind of like the imparting the secret message to the world. It's like, hey, you know, life is to be enjoyed, not endured. Right, you know? right. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you're very good at that. From from a live standpoint, you know, like, and and you know this. I mm -hmm. grew up with a, a father, drummer, lead singer. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I'm we became so, so I'm either I'm either blessed or cursed. <laughs> Blursed. <laughs> Because it's natural for me to see you there. For yeah. me, that's what I grew up with. Yeah. And you don't throw drumsticks at the back of my head like my dad used to um, and tell me to slow down <laughs> and get in the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he used to tell me when I was a kid. Well, and I'd get a, you know, drumstick in the back. Slow down. Yeah. You're ahead of the beat. Yeah. Count it off. You know. No, we, and he used to call it weedily weedily. Weedily weedily. Weedily that's weedily. We, that's what we call it. Yeah, that's yeah. what we call it. <laughs> no weedily weedily, you know. Oh, yeah. Play the chord right. You know, that kind Matt, of thing. Matt Jones, who played, played with us for a long time, and he, he's going to play with us tonight. He's coming in. Nice. He, he just, oh, I love Matt. Yeah, Matt's great. He, uh, he played for... Um, he played with us for years. He recently left the band just to focus on some other career stuff. Uh, but he's going to come in tonight and play with us. It used to frustrate him when, uh, when, we, when he first started working with the band because he's a very highly technical, highly yeah. skilled, highly focused guitar player. And, you know, we'd be in the studio and he'd play me a track he did. It's like, what do you think? It's like, man, that sounds, that sounds too good. <laughs> you need to mess that up a bit. You need to screw it up a bit. Go back. Don't play it so correctly. You know, yeah. just mess it up a little bit. Yeah, make you know? it more human. Make it more human. Make, yeah, exactly. You know, I'm not playing in a band with Mark Zuckerberg. You know, <laughs> I'm, I, you know, I'm playing with other people, and we're trying to convey this feeling, this emotion, this experience. You know, and and I've always tried to do that. That's that was the whole goal of forming this band. I wanted to I wanted to do something that would be very different. I had an IED go off right under my vehicle, pop the tires, shattered the windshield, and just shrapnel was everywhere. I have this window where I know something's not right. If I go past that window, I can go just completely off the rails. It's like being an actor in your own life. You're watching yourself do these things that you have no control over. 
you're watching yourself kind of self implode almost. My heart was just beating like a thousand miles an hour. Like, am I gonna die? It's like a darkness. It's hard to escape from. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. For more information, please visit www.guitarsforvets.org. That's guitar with an S, the number four, vets.org. We had this producer once, his name was John Hampton. He was out of Memphis. He was a great engineer, great producer. He, his main claim to fame was that he produced all the big records for the Gin Blossoms. Oh. Yeah, really oh, talented a lot of hits. guy, talented guy. And he was just, and he just had this bigger than life personality. Just total Southern character. And he, he, he gave us a really great compliment. I love you guys. You guys, are like, your songs are like nursery rhymes for adults. I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, okay, that works. You know, so. Okay. Yeah, so. Well, and then that, that's a good segue you bring up because everybody I've ever talked to um, about Cowboy Mouth all say one thing they uh -oh. have in common. Uh-oh. Lyrically, there's always a Fred line that everybody quotes, and it's always, <laughs> and it's never the same line because you have this thing. Uh, John, when I was talking to John Thomas, he brought it up too about, yeah, no matter what song we're in, there is, you know, I'm Kane and now I'm not able, or, yeah, huh. you know, she, you know, Kelly Ripa, she's the mom with the body of a stripper, or something. There, she you, is. <laughs> but you have this, she really is. you have this knack with lyrics where uh -huh. you create something. Is that how your mind works? I how does that no come idea. about? Because, I have no idea. Because Cowboy Mouth, I, and I like it, they're hooks to me, because uh, yeah. they stick in your head. Yeah. And, and, and it obviously sticks in other people. So when you talk to them, they say, hey, I'm, I'm going to go sit in with Cowboy Mouth. I'm going to hang out with Fred. Mm. Oh, I love that song where he says, you know, you know, I believe the spirit of rock and roll. And I believe, you know, mm. you know, and all those kinds of things. And I personally, I tell them, because they always ask me, well, is he always like that? You know, when he is on, because you're larger than life on stage, but stage, I yeah. always tell them, yes, Fred is always Fred. It's just, this is just a more dialed up on stage yeah, because yeah, yeah. he's on stage. But if the lyrics, the music, that's you. They're, those are pieces, to me, those are pieces of yeah. you. Well, I, this, yeah. Knowing you, I see the, the little things. You see the symbiosis. Yeah, well, even <laughs> the EP that you and I did together, yeah. working mm -hmm. with you and yeah, writing yeah. songs, mm -hmm. like like one of my favorite lines you had ever written is in that one song we did that She Don't Love Me No More Blues, yeah, yeah, where yeah. everybody's sexy when the lights are out. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's What is the line? Uh, nobody's that pretty. Yeah. Nobody's, nobody's that smart. And everybody's sexy when the lights are off. Or something like that. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, the lights uh, are out. Yeah. yeah. Or off, yeah, yeah. But no need to me complaining. Cause she don't want me no more blues. Right, but I love that line well, thank you. because thank again, you. that's what sticks. You know. Well, you mean? know the thing about it is, just like, uh, you know, with that song, and with a lot of the songs, I guess with most of the good ones, you know, those lines are, I was living that, either in that moment or I had lived it, and mm -hmm. the experience stayed with me, you know. But, you know, songwriting is, you know, once again, it's not a conscious activity. When I sit there and try to write a song, it sucks. <laughs> you know, it's like, a, oh, we're going to rock tonight. Everything's going to be all right. <laughs> you know, it's only like, you know, I had a song come to me the other night. Uh, what was it? Mississippi River Rain. And it was very bluesy. And I woke up at like 1 o'clock in the morning. And I sat there and, and it just came to me. But it took about an hour and a half to get all the lyrics right. And my poor wife's trying to sleep next to me. It's like, I'm almost finished, baby. Listen to this. Listen, what do you think? I'm going to sleep. You know, so. Yeah. But, you know, songwriting is not the best songs for me personally. There's some people who can do this. I've always envied those people because they can just reach in and grab that or they have that thing where they can just do it at will. I can't do that. I have to wait until inspiration holds. I can, I can move it and shape it and craft it and push it towards something that I hope it'll be, but at the same time, you know, I have to wait until that, until that moment hits me, you know, right. and then you just, you go with it. Right. So. And you are very natural, like when we've sat and, and, and written stuff before, yeah. uh -huh. you, you, and that one song in particular, I forget which one it was, you, you actually said, that we need to stop, I'm done. Uh, it's, cause, I'm done. Because you it. learned over time, and, it, and it, is, it does get that way as you write a lot, mm -hmm. you yeah. find out this is a wall, 
it, moving forward, we're just going to get more frustrated. Yeah, if we're you just for- going to, you know. If you force something, you know, it's the, uh, it's the flow of life. It's the flow of God. It's the flow of however you choose to look at it, you know. And if you take, and if you try to, what's the term, push the river yeah. a certain way, you know, one or the other, then you just, like you say, you're going to hit a brick wall. And, you know, we've played shows in front of 150,000 people, and we've played shows in front of one person. And the common denominator of all those shows is that we kicked ass. And the thing about it, you know, like, you know, you're in front of, you know, thousands of people, and you think in that moment, I'm going to do something that's going to look really cool, and I'm going to look awesome. And then you do it, and you fall on your (laughs) face. It's like, okay. And, and that's then, kind of pushing the river. It's yeah. like, I'm, I'm taking myself out of this flow, you know? And there, then when I, when I think like that, I just get in my own way. Whereas if I just kind of stay and let the music and the energy take me where it wants to go, yeah. then, you know, that's usually where the reward is, you know? It's like, I always say like, you know, the best part of any show for me is that moment I walk off stage and I think, okay, I've done my very best. There's nothing else I can do. I've done my Amen. very best. That's a good feeling. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Whether because of discomfort, lack of mobility, your lifestyle, or occupation, you sit inactively way too many hours a day. Introducing Ellipse, the premium quality automatic seated exerciser that strengthens legs, increases mobility, and boosts circulation without physical strain or impact. It is so quiet that none of my coworkers even know I'm using it. Strengthen and tone your legs. Increase your mobility, flexibility, and balance. Plus, stimulate healthy circulation. My joints feel better, my knees feel better, my back feels better. It makes me feel stronger too. Perfect for home therapy. Whisper quiet to use while you work. My circulation is moving, I'm burning calories, and it makes me feel energetic. Call now and order Ellipse, the seated exerciser that strengthens legs, increases mobility, and boosts circulation. Call and get upgraded to the deluxe bundle. Get the faster motor for five miles of steps per hour, the step counter, the sport mat, and wireless remote. Call now. We both share a love for the blues, so it was a bucket list item for the two of us to do this record where it all started. We got with our friend Reggie Thomas, who was born and raised in Meridian, Mississippi. He shot the video for Lord Watch Over Me. He shot the making of the video for us. What an honor it was to do this record at Ground Zero in Meridian, Mississippi. I was born in Chicago and uh, grew up with the blues. And in in that particular time, there was this really cool mix of punk and blues. And and growing up, I didn't know really the difference between the two. I mean, of course, tempos were different and one was much louder than the other, but they both had the exact same attitude. So I guess my approach to the blues is with maybe a little bit of a punk attitude because the blues guys were hardcore back in the day. So, and so we're the punk guys. So for me, it just seemed like a lot of the same thing, just different generations. So I have this, I guess, weird mix of, of punk and blues, but to me, in, in my head, it all makes sense. I've been playing music for as far back as I can remember. In fact, I was born deaf. My folks used to lay my head on stereo speakers in order to kind of draw me out of my world. I didn't have an operation until I was about three to where I could actually hear, but I was singing long before that. I have a band now out of New Orleans called Cowboy Mouth that I've been playing with for about 25 years. Before then, I was in a band called Dash Rip Rock that tore up the USA for a while. I've been very fortunate to play my music my way for a long time. I'm pretty happy to be jamming with Tony. I knew of Fred before I met him, and he's, his reputation of being an amazing frontman, singer, uh, drummer, you know, Cowboy Mouth has been around for a, for a long time, very well respected. I mean, the way he demands a crowd, you know, it's a little intimidating when you meet 
when you know of the reputation of a man and then you meet the man. It, and you end up finding out that um, he's the nicest, coolest guy. Yes, this is something that he does. He has this gift, you know, with people and, and being able to command a crowd. And, but it comes from this place inside him that's completely genuine. He, it's, not, it's not a switch. Because I've worked with a lot of professional musicians, a lot of front guys where they're really kind of one way backstage and then as soon as they hit that stage, they, that switch clicks on and they're, now they're this performer. Fred's not that guy. Fred is Fred 24 hours a day. He, he doesn't know any better. It's very natural. It flows through him and that's why I think he's, in my opinion, one of the best. Yeah, this one was fun. Most of them are tedious. Most of them are very long because the the, uh, the semantics of making a, a music video are very similar to a TV show and a movie, and it's a very tedious process where a lot of the times the performance is chopped up into like, you know, a hundred different segments. And so you have to wait for all the technical people to get the lighting right, to get the position of the camera right, to get the sound right, and then you go in and do your thing. And sometimes it'll take like, you know, like five seconds. Lord Watch Over Me is a song that uh, Tony sent me the music to and I was uh, listening to a lot more blues. I had just moved to Mississippi because uh, my wife at the time uh, is a physician and she got some work here and plus her parents are here and both of my parents are gone and I wanted our kids to have a really direct interaction with their family, with their grandparents and things. And so I agreed to move up here while still having the band out in New Orleans and going back and forth. So um, I was trying to get into the culture of Mississippi a little more. I've always been a huge fan of the blues. And so being kind of in one of the cradles of the blues, I, I found a little inspiring. Plus, you know, being a new dad and trying to, trying to be a good husband, trying to lay off the sauce and trying to be the best person I could be. You know, I wrote about my own personal struggle of, you know, saying, okay, you know, I'm doing my best, but Lord watch over me. And it all just kind of came to me. Not that I was battling any sort of real addiction or anything like that, but just the idea of putting your faith in something greater than yourself, something that's still a part of you, but a greater part of you. What was funny, I, I wanted to shoot it indoors, um, down, down in, in either in Perdido or in um, Pensacola. And I had a really hard time finding a good indoor location for us to shoot. And uh, this realtor lady uh, said to me, she goes, why do you have to shoot it indoors? And I said, well, I just don't want to be, you know, the weather, you know, I, I just, if we're indoors, you know, the film guys, they can control the surroundings. And I just, if you know, knowing my luck, we'd probably get a bad day. And she said, you know, we're not known for our indoors around here. So that's what I started thinking, like, yeah, you know, it's so beautiful in Perdido and in Pensacola. A friend of mine, uh, Charlie, has a, a, an amazing house off the intercoastal waterway. And uh, he offered his house, his backyard, and his, his dock for us to set up and shoot our music video right, right there in Perdido Key, right on the intercoastal. And as I called people up, you know, it wasn't too hard to ask people to be in a music video, especially one with, with Fred LeBlanc's gonna be in it. So a lot of people were like, hey, I'm gonna bring my boat. Now I'm coming out with this one. And, and it turned into a cool thing. We catered it. Then I told the Martellis, you have to come out, you have to be a part of it. And they came out and had a great time and we, it was a good vibe. And when you watch the video, I think you get the sense, you know, of, of you know, what we're going for because the, the visual had to match the song. The song is so uplifting and so positive and it's such a feel good song that the video had to match that. So, um, and I think it did. And we generally had a good day that we, we couldn't ask for better weather that day or better lighting and it just turned out amazing.
So please, Lord, watch over me. I can feel a certain feeling starting to get the better of me. But the road ahead is of my choosing. So please, Lord, watch over me. Yeah. Had a love so truly The prettiest girl you ever did see But she left me for another someone So please, Lord, watch over me I don't want to turn so fitter That I can't see the world for what it could be I gotta get past my heart So please, Lord, watch over me Please, Lord, watch over me over me so get me a glass of water keeping that liquor away from me cause I don't have the strength to fall now so please Lord watch over me please Lord watch over me please Lord watch over me Backstage stories? Become a member of our Patreon page. You'll get access to bonus footage, full performances, swag, and special live events where you can interact with guests. This is your Backstage Pass. Hi, good. I'm looking for Marsha. Well, you got her right here. Hey, uh, you must be Chrissy. I am Chrissy. Um, we're talking about our book. Yes. God called me to go to Africa, and I would just go to Africa to minister to the people. 